to welcome everybody to tonight's fireside chat with Lyndon LaRouche of the LaRouche Organization. Uh, my name is Dennis Speed, and we're going to be getting started here right away. I want to first of all just let people know about a special event that we'll be holding this coming Saturday. It will change the normal time of our meeting, and that time will now be 12 noon, it's normally 2 p.m., so it'll be two hours earlier than normal. This is done in part to accommodate audiences in Europe in particular, and uh, a few other locations. Uh, the conference is being called What Just Happened in Afghanistan. Now more urgently than ever, Afghanistan is an opportunity for a new epoch for mankind. And uh, there's a statement that we put out from Helga Sheplarouche, who will be speaking uh, together with some others. She said this to say, just taking two paragraphs of that statement. First of all, I do not agree with the hysteria of the Western media that this is the end of the world. The first thing that must be stated is that it ends 40 years of war for the Afghani people. And if people have any sense of what it means to live in such a long war, all the suffering of the civilians, all the terrible things people had to endure in terms of drone attacks, anxiety, and so on, I think, first of all, it's very good that the war has ended uh, she says, this is on the contrary, the real chance to integrate Afghanistan, Afghanistan into a regional economic development perspective. Uh, she, uh, I'm going to the conclusion in which she says, the United States must go back to the foreign policy of the founding fathers in the initial period of the nation, such as John Quincy Adams, that the aim of the United States is not to chase foreign mo- monsters, uh, actually look, go abroad looking for monsters to fight, uh, but to build alliances. John Quincy Adams said that the United States should have alliances of perfectly sovereign republics, and this is now the moment to really do that. The idea is not to oppose China linking Afghanistan into the Belt and Road Initiative, but rather to see it as an opportunity to cooperate and stop this geopolitical confrontation, which can only lead to catastrophe. Uh, and said that's the kind of discussion we wish to catalyze, and that is exactly true. So joining Helga on the platform on Saturday will be Mr. Uh, and Dr. Pino Arlacchi. He's a sociology professor at the Cesare University of Italy, but he's the former executive director of the UN of the United Nations Office for Drug Control and Crime Prevention. If you were with us uh, on July 31st, uh, on Saturday you heard him, and his extraordinary presentation, which a lot of people were talking about afterwards. He will be with us. Ray McGovern uh, from the United States, CIA retired, an analyst for CIA for 27 years, and co-founder of the Veterans Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Uh, He will be with us. Hussein Askari, Southwest Asia coordinator for the Schiller Institute, will be speaking. Also Harley Schlanger. There may be other speakers, but those are the ones that I know of. And there will be a very live and lively question and answer period. But we, of course, urge that people that will have something to say about Afghanistan, excuse me, have questions about what our policy was there and should be there, should come on that platform and ask questions and uh, make whatever statements they wish. Uh, And that will be, as I say, this coming Saturday at 12 noon. All right, so essentially what we want to do is get right into uh, our topic of tonight. I want to say one thing just to give people a sense of why this becomes so important. You know, we have a peculiar circumstance in the United States because of the character of a kind of full-spectrum brainwashing process that no population in recorded history ever went through. Uh, just take a simple fact that back in 1840, 1835, when Edgar Poe was uh, frequenting New York City, uh, there were about approximately 300 newspapers in New York City at that time. Uh, if you look at the city today, I think there are three uh, primary papers, if that many. Uh, there's the New York Post, the, 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 the New York Times. Uh, there really isn't really the daily news anymore. You have the news day out in Long Island. But you, you don't have discourse uh, that goes on in the country 
that offers different points of view. You can say whatever you want to say about the Internet, but we all know the truth of the Internet, which is that if you, in fact, threaten uh, what has become an externally imposed narrative on certain topics, particularly something like the famous climate change slash global warming, you will be executed on the, in, on the Internet. So it is not true uh, that you have a freedom of thought. But why that's significant is that the purpose of that is not to stop you from discussing uh, 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 things of the moment. It's for the purpose of pre-censoring investigations into both the nature of current history and the prospects for a new future. Uh, and that's how, that's how you do it. You pre-censor so that people don't even get to the point of thinking about thinking in certain directions. And so when you get to situations like Afghanistan and what our policy really is or was, and many statements have been made by uh, German uh, and other spokespersons, for example, uh, uh, well, they, I actually won't give the examples because they're too, too, too numerous right at the moment. But, but uh, p- various uh, people are, are making statements stating that this is a defeat for the West, um, that we need to think about how this happened. We need to look at ourselves because now we're going to have this catastrophe occur in Afghanistan. Well, actually, the policy outlook that Franklin Delano Roosevelt represented, for example, placed the United States in Afghanistan during the period of the late 40s and 50s, helping to build that nation. And in fact, much infrastructure was built during that time. From the standpoint of the kind of initiatives that Franklin Delano Roosevelt wished to have occur in the aftermath of the Second World War. Now, that is not to say that Roosevelt's policies were implemented. I didn't say that. What I, what I would say, though, that happened, and it's important to recognize, is that those people who had gone through the Second World War and had seen the world and had vowed never to allow the world to get in that situation again, attempted to change the world and develop it in an instinctive way. But they're now dead. That entire generation virtually has left the scene. Uh, And what British intelligence did was to make sure that the descendants of that generation, in the case of the United States in particular, would have no connection, no memory, and therefore would not carry out any form of policy, which actually represented the greater interest and the higher interest both of the United States and of the world as a whole. How that process happened uh, has to be called attention to. Um, That's what we've been trying to do for many weeks and months, uh, recently particularly since the the, the 75th anniversary of the Second World War uh, last year. Vladimir Putin and others were talking about this, and uh, Lyndon LaRouche, prior to his death, had made this a very particular point of intervention, particularly five years ago, around the 15th anniversary of 9-11, the 9-11 attack. On this impending uh, 20th anniversary, what we want to do is to resurrect that original commitment that Lyndon LaRouche made to force the United States to confront its own humiliation. And that humiliation was not the bombing. Uh, The humiliation is the abandonment of the ideas of the American Revolution such that those kinds of actions could be taken, including deploying or utilizing treasonous elements in the American intelligence community, in the, in the, in the Anglo-American financial establishment, against uh, the population of the United States and the interest of the United States as a whole. How did that happen? How did we reach this point? Uh, and what was the, 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 the prospect for the future that Roosevelt intended? So to discuss that and to discuss in, uh, implicitly a way that all of you can begin to join us in this uh, digging up of the true history of the United States. We have Jerry Rose, and uh, we'll be able, after he gives his presentation, you'll be able to ask him whatever questions you have about the things he's going to tell you. So, Jerry? Yeah, thanks a lot. Can I be heard, Dennis? Yeah, good. you're clear. We're good? Okay, great. So I, I raise a certain question uh, in the preface to uh, this discussion uh, in which I had asked Dennis if I could 
uh, do the Thursday talk um, after the Lyndon LaRouche Memorial discussion or the LLC discussion on the twenty uh, uh, the anniversary of the uh, Bretton Woods agreement uh, and the actual overthrow of those Bretton Woods agreements uh, um, in 1971 in which uh, LaRouche had made his uh, fundamental forecast of what would happen. Uh, And the question that comes up because you can't repeat history. You cannot. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's not repeatable in that sense, uh, in the way that Franklin Roosevelt did it. Because at the time, the dollar in the 1944 Bretton Woods uh, uh, meeting, the dollar was not only the dominant currency, uh, but it, we had become the most powerful economy in the history of mankind. So it wasn't a monetary question, although the dollar was stable beyond belief because we had backed it up with enormous productive capability, which if Franklin Roosevelt and his team had lived the whole world would have, uh, there would have been a a change as Bretton Woods uh, uh, indicated, uh, that every nation on the planet would have both a stable currency issued by a, a national bank backed up by credits from the uh, uh, what was later, uh, uh, really, it was the International Reconstruction uh, Bank, uh, which was later called the World Bank. But it wasn't the World Bank. It was the Reconstruction uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, Development Bank. So that there would be a series of absolutely sovereign nations with industrial capability because the nations had learned, particularly the developing sector nations, if you were a one crop economy, which they had suffered from in the depression, you were, you were thrown into complete chaos. Uh, and the prices fell, uh, the, uh, uh, with, with the tariffs, you couldn't export it. Uh, and particularly the uh, Ibero-American nations uh, were completely devastated by the Depression, as was Europe. Uh, So the vision that uh, occurred in 1944 was uh, a very clear uh, in a a series of books uh, and book-length discussions uh, one called The Forgotten Foundations of Bretton Woods. I've given presentations on this. Richie Freeman's really stunning work on Brazil and what the United States did to develop Brazil uh, going into the war and during the war. Uh, um, and, of course, uh, Paul Gallagher's work on this question. So, But in 2002... Lyndon LaRouche, uh, recognizing that either George Bush Jr. would be president or Al Gore, uh, 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 you could not really think about the United States dollar and the United States credit uh, uh, as, as any basis for a a Bretton Woods type agreement. There were certain fundamental principles involved, which have not changed, which Lyndon LaRouche, uh, more than anyone in the history of mankind, 
understood what those principles were. But to seriously propose that George Bush Jr. or Al Gore could do it, uh, uh, it, it was anathema. You couldn't do it that way. The principles were the same, but you couldn't do it that way. And therefore, the, what he proposed in a very important work, which we're not going to get into tonight, because um, I'm going to do something slightly different, but in a very important work, Trade Without Currency, LaRouche identified a series of initial regional arrangements, which is obviously what Russia and China I think Japan will get in on it. There'll be certain bricks or, or an aspect of that. Uh, um, where you, you'd start with certain regional arrangements, and then you, you could, based upon certain clarity on fundamental principle, you could reconstruct a Bretton Woods-type arrangement to stabilize world trade but more importantly, issue credit, uh, real credit, not money. Money is not credit, uh, 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 which, of course, is the principles of the Belt and Road. Uh, and and uh, we will get into that discussion. Uh, but the question you, uh, to me, which... Uh, I wanted to develop tonight in a, in a slightly different way than I have ever developed it, uh, more along the lines of a classical drama. Because if you understand what the mission uh, of the Bretton Woods uh, 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 and the UN, there is no difference between the Bretton Woods and the UN, as we will as you will discover tonight. Uh, and the mission that Franklin Roosevelt identified, which I'm going to do something uh, like a classical drama from the book As He Saw It by Elliot Roosevelt, who is the only eyewitness to what Franklin Roosevelt really thought. I mean, there were indications of it. He said it, but never as clearly and never as succinctly as his discussions with Elliot, who accompanied him to the first meetings with Churchill, to the first meetings uh, with Stalin, at Tehran, at Churchill at Argentia, and later Cairo, his meetings with de Gaulle, uh, in which Franklin was extremely clear about what the mission and his own personal mission for himself, the United States, and mankind generally. Uh, uh, and it was stunning to me. Uh, uh, it just jumped out at me. Much of what I had hypothesized about what Franklin Roosevelt was thinking was even more explicit in his discussion with Eliot than I remember. Uh, and I'm going to first give you what... Elliot, why Elliot Roosevelt wrote the book as he saw it. Now, as he saw it, the he is Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, and the uh, he I says, quote, the decision to write this book was taken and impelled by urgent events. Winston Churchill's speech at Fulton, Missouri had a hand in the decision. The stockpiling of American atom bombs is a compelling factor. All the signs of disunity 
among the leading nations of the world, broken promises, all reminiscent of power politics, of greedy, desperate imperialism, were my spurs. The tempo of our times is such that our opinions are not key to history, but to headlines. Whether we trust or distrust Russia is not conditioned by that nation's mighty contribution to our victory in the war. Still, the greatest single fact of our lifetime, rather it is molded by scare print, front pages of three or four days newspapers. So this impelled Elliot to write up his notes uh, uh, from uh, his discussions with his father. Some of this we have quoted in the EIR and in other places, but what I want to do tonight is go through the full range of what Franklin Roosevelt thought. Because once you understand that, and it converges as you would think if you understand history on a classical drama. So, here is uh, Roosevelt. Another thing Roosevelt said, the British Empire is at stake here. Uh, now, he's, he's uh, speaking um, uh, about what, but not, not Britain, but the British Empire is at stake here. Uh, it's, it's something that is not generally known, but British bankers and German bankers have had the world trade pretty well sewn up in their pockets for a long time, despite the fact that Germany lost in the last war. Well, now, that's no good for American trade, is it? If in the past, German and British economic interests have operated to exclude us from world trade, kept our merchant ships down, closed us out of this or that market, and now Germany and Britain are at war, what should we do? We've got to make clear to the British from the very outset that we don't intend to be simply a good-time Charlie who can be used to help the British Empire out of a tight spot and then be forgotten. Churchill told me he was not His Majesty's Prime Minister for the purpose of presiding over the dissolution of the British Empire. I think I speak as American president when I say that America won't help England in this war simply so that she will be able to continue to ride roughshod over colonial people further. The challenges at uh, Argentia, uh, which is the first meeting that he directly confronts Churchill, that he's just speaking to Eliot, is the first meeting he directly confronts Churchill. And he says, um, of course, once through after the war, one of the preconditions of any lasting peace will have to be the greatest possible freedom of trade. No artificial barriers. A few favored economic agreements as possible. Opportunities for expansion. Markets open for healthy competition. Churchill shifted in his armchair. The British Empire trade agreements are, and father broke in, yes, those empire trade agreements, which were basically the British, uh, those members of the Commonwealth, sold to the British what they wanted, when they wanted, 
at what price they wanted. And they got back pretty much nothing. And there were massive trade imbalances, particularly with India, but every single colony was literally looted to the bone. This is what uh, Roosevelt is talking about. The case in point, it's, uh, okay, well, here, here. Yes, those empire trade agreements are a case in point. It's because of them that the people of India and Africa and all colonial Near East and Far East are still backward as they are. Churchill, neck reddening. Mr. President, England does not propose for a moment to lose a favored position among the British dominions. The trade that has made England great shall continue under conditions prescribed by England's minister. You see, said Roosevelt slowly, it's along here, somewhere, that there is likely to be massive disagreement between you, Winston, and me. I am firmly of the belief that if we are to arrive at a stable peace, it must involve the development of backward countries, backward peoples. How can this be done? It can't be done by 18th century methods. Uh, Churchill goes, who's talking about 18th century methods? Which every of your minister, ministers recommend a policy which takes wealth and raw materials out of a colonial country which returns nothing to the people of that country in consideration. 20th century methods involve bringing industry to those uh, colonies. 20th century methods include increasing the wealth of the people by increasing their standard of living, by educating them, by bringing them sanitation, by making sure they get a return uh, 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 raw, uh, uh, return for the raw wealth of their community. Then he says, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Churchill says, uh, uh, well, yes, I can't believe that we can fight a war. This is Roosevelt. I can't believe we can fight a war against fascist slavery and at the same time not work to free people all over the world from backward colonial policies. So Churchill confronts him with the Philippines, that they they were a colony of the United States. So, Roosevelt, I'm glad you mentioned them. They get their independence, you know, in 1946, and they've gotten modern sanitation, modern education. Their rate of literacy has gone down. There can be no tampering with the empire's economic agreements. That's Churchill. Roosevelt, they're artificial. Churchill, they're the foundations of our greatness. The peace, Roosevelt said, cannot include any continued despotism. The structure of peace demands and will get equality of people. Equality of peoples involved in the utmost freedom of trade, of education. Will anyone suggest that Germany's attempt to dominate trade in Central Europe was not a major contributing factor to war? Then at the uh, uh, meeting in Argentia, uh, where, again, this was the first time during wartime that Churchill and Roosevelt met. Uh, Roosevelt insisted and would not, will, would not fight the war unless the Atlantic Charter was signed. And I'm going to read you the key excerpts from the Atlantic Charter. Uh, and this was signed off by both uh, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt, that their countries, meaning the United States and, the, uh, and England, uh, or United Kingdom, 
that their countries seek no aggrandizement, territorial or other, that they desire to see no territorial changes that did not accord with freely expressed wishes of the people concerned, that they respect the rights of all people to choose the form of government under which they live, and that they wish to see sovereign rights and self-government restored to those who have been forcibly deprived of them, that they will endeavor with due respect for their existing obligations to further the enjoyment of all states, great or small, victor or vanquished, of access on equal terms to trade, to raw materials, of which the world uh, uh, are needed for their economic prosperity, prosperity, that they desire to bring about the fullest collaboration between all nations in economic field with the object of securing for all improved labor standards, economic adjustment, and social security that after the final destruction of Nazi tyranny, they hope to see established a peace which will afford all nations the means of dwelling in safety within their own boundaries, which will afford assurances that all the men in all the lands may live out their lives in freedom from fear and want. That such a peace should enable all men to traverse the high seas and oceans without hindrance, that they believe that all of the nations of the world, for realistic as well as spiritual reasons, must come to the abandonment of the use of force, since no future peace can be maintained if land, sea, and air armaments continued to be employed by nations which threaten or may threaten aggression outside of their frontiers. They believe, pending the establishment of wider and permanent system of general security, that the disarmament of such nations is essential, that they likewise aid and encourage all other practicable measures which will lighten uh, uh, which will lighten for peace-loving people the crushing burden of armaments. And he forced Churchill to sign that. Now this, now it becomes, these are things that we have discussed before. But now, uh, at the Casablanca conference, um, This is Roosevelt now. His thoughts, Roosevelt's thoughts, turn to the problem of economies and colonial markets, the problems which he felt was at the core of all chances for future peace. The thing is, he remarked thoughtfully, the colonial system means war. Exploit the resources of India a Burma, a Java, take all the wealth out of those countries, but never put anything back into them like education, standard of living, minimum health requirements. All you're doing is storing up the kind of trouble that leads to war. All you're doing is negating the value of any kind of organizational structure for peace before it begins. Then he goes on, and he's talking to his son now. Um, This morning, he said, I must tell Churchill what I found out about his British Gambia today. At Bathurst, meaning uh, this place uh, that he landed and getting into uh, Casablanca, uh, which uh, Elliot said. This morning, he said, And now there's a real feeling in his voice. About 8.30, we drove through Bathurst to the airfield. The natives were just getting to work in rags, glum looking. They told us the natives would look happier around noontime 
when the sun should have burned off the dew from the chill. I was told that the prevailing wages for these men was one and nine. One shilling, nine pence, less than 50 cents. Elliot says, an hour? Roosevelt, a day. 50 cents a day, besides which they're given a half a, half a cup of rice. He shifted uneasily in, in his big bed. Roosevelt was in bed. Dirt, disease, very high mortality rates. I, uh, I asked. Life expectancy, you'd never guess what it is. 26 years. These people are treated worse than the livestock. Their cattle live longer. He was silent for a moment. Churchill may have thought I wasn't serious last time. He'll find out this time. Okay, now then, again, at Casablanca, uh, he met with the Sultan of Tunisia which was a French colony. Uh, And he said, in southern Tunisia, which must have had one time been a vast inland sea, he reminded us of the rivers that sprung up in the Atlas Mountains to the south and disappear under the Sahara to become subterranean rivers. Divert, this is Roosevelt, divert this water flow for irrigation purposes. It would make the Imperial Valley in California look like a cabbage patch. And the salt flats, they were below the level of the Mediterranean. You could dig a canal straight back to recreate that lake, 150 miles long, 60 miles wide. The Sahara would bloom for hundreds of miles. It's true. The Sahara is not just sand. It has an amazing rich potential. Every time there is a rain, there is a consequent riot of flowers for a few days before the dryness. Frankly, okay, then, wealth, said uh, uh, Roosevelt, imperialists don't realize what they can do, what they can create. They robbed this continent of billions, and all because they were too stupid to understand that their billions were pennies compared to the possibilities, possibilities that must include a better life for the people who inhabit this land. Further. Okay, Indochina. This is, this, this, uh, you know, this he discussed with Stalin also. Uh, that France, at the end of the war, would not get back any of its colonies. Uh, They didn't fight the war, really, except for de Gaulle and what he could rally around him and some others, but minor. Uh, And here is uh, Roosevelt now. He looked at me. How does Indochina belong to France? Why does Morocco, inhabited by Moroccans, belong to France? Or take Indochina? The Japanese control that colony now. Why was it a cinch for the Japanese to conquer that land? The native Indochinese have been so flagrantly downtrodden that they thought to themselves, anything must be better than to live under French colonial rule. Should a land, should that land belong to France? But what logic, by what custom, by what historic rule? I'm talking about what will happen to our world if after this war, we allow millions of people to slide back into semi-slavery. Don't think for a moment that Americans would be dying in the Pacific tonight if, we hadn't, if it hadn't been for the short-sighted greed of the French, the British, and the Dutch. Shall we allow them to do it all again, all over again? Your son, he's talking to Elliot, will be about the right age, 15, 
or 20 from now, years from now. Okay. Now, even our alliance in Britain, he went on, holds dangers of making it seem to China and Russia that we support the British. And he said, and this is critical, and this is where the actual Bretton Woods uh, uh, was, was formulated. This is at Casablanca. He, he says, the United States will have to lead, he said, lead and use our good offices always to conciliate, to help to solve the differences which will arise between others, between Russia and England in Europe, between the British Empire and China, between China and Russia, and in the Far East. We will be able to do that because we're big, we're strong, we're self-sufficient. Britain is on the decline. China is still in the 18th century. America is the only great power that can make peace in the world and make it stick. And I contend that that, that is exactly what the Bretton Woods meeting was about. Uh, Harry Dexter White had no time for Keynes. I mean, he listened to him, but he had no time for him. That the um, that the dollar, that the development of central banking uh, uh, for each nation, and this was a brawl because uh, Keynes wanted to have what was called a... Um, uh, uh, something like a currency board. He wanted to have all the currencies together and central bankers would determine what each currency was worth and this kind of thing. Uh, and White would have nothing of it. He said the dollar backed by gold reserves, uh, 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 that will be the basis for trade worldwide that the credit for will be issued, and this was absolutely no give on this question, that the credit will be issued to banks that would be run by those countries, not by central banks uh, 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 of, uh, of European and related powers. Uh, and this they did at Cuba and other places. They actually did it in Paraguay, but they proposed it in Cuba. Uh, and Morgenthau and White were not interested in what Wall Street and London had to say at all. I could give you chapter and verse on that. I think at one point I did uh, in some other lecture. Okay, now... Okay. I'm going to skip something here. Um, okay, this is critical. Um, American foreign policy, and this was again at Cairo, uh, after he met with Chiang Kai-shek. American foreign policy after the war must be along the lines of bringing about a realization on the part of the British, the French, the Dutch. The way we have run the Philippines is the only way they can run their colonies. Uh, and then he said the British should be made content to maintain economic preferential treatment while granting political independence. The French have no rights after the war simply to walk back into, into China and reclaim that rich land for no reason other than it once had been their colonies. Uh, and he said the purpose of the United Nations is to enforce the end of colonial rule. 
that was the purpose. Um, okay, there was uh, there's some other things, but uh, I just want to get to this point here. Um, this was uh, uh, when the uh, this was near the end of the war. And uh, Roosevelt, this was uh, uh, after Tehran. Greece, he said, Franklin Roosevelt, British troops fighting against the guerrillas who fought the Nazis for the last four years. He made no attempt to conceal his anger. This is Elliot speaking. I had seen only a vague, obviously incomplete story in one of the newspapers, uh, the complete story uh, would not be printed for some weeks to come. This is Franklin Roosevelt now. How the British can dare such a thing, the lengths to which they will go to hang on to the past. Uh, he said, uh, uh, then he calmed down. He said, you know, it was just about a year ago that Queen Wilhelmina was here in the White House for a visit. We got to talking. I should say I got her talking about Dutch colonies, of what they were going to happen to them after the war. Java, Borneo, all the Nether Netherlands, East Indies. Talk back and forth for more than six hours over two or three evenings. I made the point it was American arms that were liberating these colonies from the Japanese, American soldiers and sailors and Marines. And I mentioned the Philippines. And Elliot, she agreed that the policy we have in the Philippines would be the pattern she would, not, she would follow in the Dutch East Indies. After the war, she promised me that her government would announce immediately after the victory of Japan, victory in Japan of over Japan, that they were going to grant the peoples of the Dutch Indies first dominion status. The point is that we are going to be able to bring pressure on the British to fall in line with our thinking in relation to the whole colonial question. It's all tied up in one package. The Dutch East Indies, the French Indochina, India, British extraterritorial rights in China, they're all going to end. We're going to be able to make this the 20th century after all. Now, the reason I read this is because it was Franklin Roosevelt who understood more profoundly than anyone in his cabinet and anyone in the world what the actual cause of the wars, two world wars, were. He was clear through his TVA proposals, through uh, the work that Richie has done, his team, as David Shaven had indicated in this Afghanistan situation. And from out of Eastern Europe there, and out of India, there was a proposal for a worldwide authority to look over the river basins of the whole world and on a TVA-type perspective, they would be developed by American methods, by American industry, by American machine tools, uh, and that indeed one of the most dramatic proposals was what was called the Danube River Basin, a TVA for the Danube River, which cut across six nations, half of them uh, uh, were uh, uh, part of this uh, under the Soviet uh, 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 system uh, and many of them were under the Western Europeans at the end of the war 
Uh, and the and guess who freaked out about this? Friedrich von Hayek. He said, you cannot know what one country and one part of the Danube would uh, want from another country. And and therefore, any attempt to develop the Danube River would be a part of an imposition of state rule. Friedrich von Hayek, 1945, insisting that indeed there is no, no, no knowable general welfare. There are no knowable uh, 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 truths, uh, which is the basis for British liberalism, uh, which was Friedrich von Hayek, the great Friedrich von Hayek, who later became an American, uh, uh, but never really was. Now, why did I go through this? Because the, the, if we do not end, and this is what I call on one level the unfinished business of Bretton Woods, because Roosevelt and his team understood exactly what this was, what exactly you needed to do, and that the combination of the Bretton Woods and the UN, which uh, we discussed uh, in the discussion I gave on Yalta with Stalin, with Stalin's support, there would, there would have been an end to colonial rule. It was precisely Churchill and the little man Truman who rejected the proposal to share nuclear weapons and nuclear technology uh, with the Soviet Union, who had fought the brunt of the war, who lost 27 million people, who, if you don't understand, you know, I've been reading these letters between Stalin and Roosevelt. Roosevelt understood exactly what had gone on. It was Roosevelt who promised, without asking the Congress of the United States, under Len Lease, a blank check for Stalin to fight the war. And at the end of the war, there were very profound agreements at Yalta to actually develop the world. But the... But you will find, the reason I read this is you will find that all true history converges on classical drama. Because it was in the passion of Franklin Roosevelt. These were not pragmatic adaptations to, to end after the war. These were profound, abiding commitments to the future of mankind and that to end war you had to end the British Empire and in Afghanistan uh, in the potential between the, uh, 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 Russia and China and other nations to end this colonial filth uh, this is the passion that guided Bretton Woods and that guided the uh, the creation of the United Nations. Any other interpretation is foolish. So that's what I wanted to present as an opener.